Welcome to the Spitzer School and welcome to the so that's the line. The triple light. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Sorry. It's been a long day. It's good to see you all. Thank you for coming this evening to the first lecture in our spring lecture series. Our spring lecture series, which is called uh, Across the Pacific Rim Architecture and Landscape in Translation. So, for those of you online who may not know, my name is Marty Gutman. I'm the Dean of the Spitzer School. And I'm delighted to welcome you online to our, our convening, as well as to welcome all of you in the audience. I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement that the Spitzer School of Architecture is grounded on the bedrock, the schist bedrock outcrop of Harlem, and is situated upon the ancestral homeland and territory of the Muncie Lenape, Wappinger, and the Kwasajek peoples. As members of an educational community, we are obliged to know the histories of dispossession that have allowed our college to flourish and thrive on a vibrant terrain and on, what, on this vibrant terrain. And as designers and thinkers, we endeavor always to build in ways that lead toward justice. And we are committed to working to dismantling the ongoing consequences of settler colonialism. So I would just like to start this series today, this evening, by acknowledging uh, what a pleasure it has been to work with my colleague, Dr. Professor Dr. <laughs> Sahal Zong, uh, in, in making this series happen for you. And I would say that I've learned a lot from our work together. And uh, uh, Sahal will introduce our guest speaker in just a minute. But before we turn to his introduction, I would like to give you a description of the series and so that you get a sense of how we're framing our conversations over the course of the semester. So what we begin with, with this series across the Pacific Rim, we begin with what the Pacific Ocean is, a place that is fluid, a sea where ideas, people, artifacts move. It questions the, the framing of this great body, of water as a barrier or a void, concepts that we, we both argue and agree are rooted in colonialism and imperialism, and instead posits the Pacific as an active stage for the exchange and translation of ideas, concepts, and materials, materials and technologies uh, about constructed environments. So the designers, Scholars, practitioners, and activists who are featured in this series are situated in places along the Pacific Rim. They examine places, products, histories along the Pacific Rim, and they call upon this positionality to offer exceptional, transnational, boundary-breaking, hybrid practices and research that contribute to our shared environment and a collective future. And so we, I've learned a lot from working with Sahel on this series, and I, it's been a, a real privilege to make this happen. Um, I'd also just like to give a shout out to my assistant, Nick Smith, without whom none of this would have taken place. Uh, Nick has been the person who's been making sure that speakers are invited, the speakers are housed, the speakers are paid, the speakers are put on um, airplanes, and, and has also been tending the web. Uh, so could we just give Nick a thank you? So much of this work goes on in, in an invisible way and it needs to be recognized. Okay, so how the floor is yours. Or the podium, what do we need to see? <laughs> All right. First, I would like to thank you, Marta Gutman, Dean Marta Gutman, for this wonderful opportunity to really pull together this uh, series of lectures. And I'm really honored to introduce uh, Chi-Chao Li as our first speaker uh, tonight in this series. Chi-Chao Li is the leading professor in Asian architecture and director of the PhD in the Constructed Environment Program at the University of Virginia. Chi-Chao holds a PhD from the University of London. He has a Master of Architecture from the Architectural Association in the UK and holds a Bachelor of the Architecture from Tsinghua University in Beijing. It is fair to say that Xu Chao is truly a bilingual uh, scholar that I really might admire because his work appears in both English and Chinese. His work focuses on the area of urban and, and architectural theory in writing and design. 
He's the author of many books, including Power and Virtual, Architecture and Modernization, Colon Ch Cultural Districts, uh, Understanding the Chinese Cities, and the most recent book, Typological Drift, Emerging Cities in China. And most recently with Scott Lack, he is the editor of Theory, Culture, and Society Spectral EQ, Against Ontology, Chinese Thoughts, and Current Thought in Vienna. So his contribution to urban and architectural uh, theory makes it very evident that the operations of the culturally and intellectually constructed values are instrumental to the production of cities and architecture. His work seeks pathways for, of intellectual understanding and response in architecture that aim to restore our pervasively technologized and ecologically strained world to its fertile functions. So I want to make this introduction a little bit more personal. Since I know it felt almost like nine years ago uh, when I you know, entered the University of Virginia uh, as a master's student in landscape architecture program. So uh, then I had more chances to interact with him when I continued into the PhD program after the MLA. So, um, and I actually want to share a story uh, during, so not, you know, not about Chicago myself in this case. Um, it's before, you know, we had so many interactions. So UVA at the time, and still now, is a, a PWI, meaning a predominantly white institution, both student and faculty. And, and to give you some numbers, and I would be only international and Asian Chinese students among the 11 students in my first year MLA uh, program. And there were actually two of us, and the other one decided to abandon me to join another studio, so I ended up being the only one. And, and, and across, the across the school, uh, you know, uh, it, there, there's also a few of, uh, you know, few of us international students. And I mean, it's changed, it's been changed over the years, but, you know, by the time it, it was the case. So the point I want to make here is that, you know, as, as a Chinese international student entering a new school, and we were surrounded by people who were different from where we came from, and it was, I would, I would use the term in comforting and also inspiring to see someone similar to your background among the faculty. And Shi Tiao and I didn't really, you know, interact until later years. Uh, but just, you know, during the first year, you know, he felt by being on the faculty page and somehow sometimes running into you in the hallway, you know, just those moments was enough to inspire someone like me. And, uh, and especially when you see someone doing research about Asian cities, and especially that body of work was well received and well respected in a U.S. school, it adds to a sense of confidence about what you know as a bilingual student and what you can bring to this body of knowledge of constructive environment. Uh, and that, you know, would in turn inspire you to seriously think about a similar path in academia that you have never thought about or unthinkable in the past. Uh, understanding, understanding that, you know, one day I, I could someday become a professor in the unit of the school, you know, like now. Uh, so I think this is really the, the most important value of having a diverse faculty in an institution just like ours. So um, Shu Chao's lecture today is titled Constructing a Main Maritime Infrastructure State. So with this lecture, he will present a new narrative about architectural history that is no longer Eurocentric. So without further ado, uh, please join me and welcome Shu Chao Li. Wow, what an introduction. <laughs> I am um, very honored to be here. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Goodman, to um, even begin this series with, with, the, with this lecture. Um, I um, uh, wanted to kind of begin with history, um, the history of a, um, a much talked about episode in, in Chinese um, imperial uh, development, but um, I want to see whether we can actually kind of twist this uh, set of events to uh, use this to describe um, architectural history and um, uh, a way of understanding uh, the, the ocean space uh, that, that this lecture series is dedicated to. Thank you. 
you know how the the curve works. Kind of arrow key. Kind of arrow key on the back. I'll do it like that. Let's see a skew point. Be good on it. Thanks, Tom. Okay, so I'm going to begin with what it is, the mean voyages um, between 1405 and 1433. Um, I want to say that the world had never seen anything like it before, and there were total seven voyages, and each comprising as many as 300 ships, and some were smaller and some are bigger, 28,000 men on those uh, voyages. Um, that include 100 envoys of various grades and 93 military captains and 114 uh, lieutenants and so on and so forth. And, and you notice that they also uh, a big presence of military um, uh, personnel on these ships. And just to give a context, and if you think about Vasco da Gama's biggest voyage to India, it was 20 ships, about uh, 1,800. This is really uh, the higher estimate of 1,800 men. And the famous or the infamous Spanish Armada was uh, 150 ships, uh, about 18,000 men. Um, the details are also quite astonishing because of the, uh, the size of the treasure ships and they're pretty big. And uh, you think about the typical carrot and have an image later to show you how in comparison with the typical European carrot, and those ships are giant, enormous ships and they included different kinds and, and ships for horses, for water, for food, and, and even ships for you to grow bean sprouts so that you don't get scurvy, which the European sailors suffer greatly. And particularly with Vasco da Gama, you know, floating on the sea for three months uh, and, and with really soldiers dying from scurvy. So uh, it's pretty amazing. Um, we have a huge challenge here because uh, there was a deliberate attempt to kind of erase these records and with the conservative faction of the Chinese, the imperial court didn't like it. So they actually destroyed a lot of the records and not much survives from uh, that period. And we have three interesting uh, records. And one is written by Ma Huan, who was a uh, scribe on three of those uh, voyages. He wrote a book um, in his 80s uh, called The Overall Survey of Ocean Shores, um, which uh, describes some of the details and places that, that, that they visited. And there's this uh, set of maps called Wu uh, uh, that was compiled in the 16th century, um, published in the, the 17th century, which has really amazing maps, and I'll show you some of the maps later. And there, there is a um, the variable, re veritable records of the name, uh, which is the historical record of the Ming dynasty uh, that has all the details of uh, who did what at the time. So this is, I want to quickly just say something about the navigation uh, skills and technologies and so on. And they had a canvas, a compass, so really quite a um, well-advanced uh, piece of instrument. They also had something that's less well known, if this works, uh, it was working, that, that um, you know, that starboard uh, is an interesting thing. It's almost like a, a Chinese version of the sextant, you know, those who are really no navigation. It's the way to measure the angle between the star and the horizon, so that you know uh, where you are. That's pretty interesting. Uh, works out again. It's all about needles and fingers. So <laughs> the needles, of course, is the, the navigation, uh, the, the the compass needle, and fingers is actually the, this the the sextant-like instrument that's measured. Each board is actually described as. Uh, a number of 
fingers, like you know, the small ones, it's like six fingers and so on. So it's written interesting, you know, like this is the navigation map, and then the, the left image it shows the starboard chart for navigation from Humus to Kalika. And you know, from Humus to Kalika, this is actually the most difficult stretch, one of the most difficult stretches of the, the uh, voyages. And, and the right one is describing from uh, um, uh, in today's um, the Malaysia, Sumatra, uh, Ras to Sri Lanka. Again, that's the open sea and it's really difficult. So these are the kind of, you know, a few maps that you find in navigation maps. Uh, they're kind of describing the difficult uh, bits of the, um, of the voyages. Um, the, uh, an interesting map, a page from that book, uh, uh, Ube Zhu, uh, that shows, I picked out a few locations just for our interest of understanding how these maps work. And you have Malindi, Kenya, uh, they are at the bottom. So if you can understand this, you know, it's a weird <laughs> map, but it's actually for navigation purposes. And you can see the, the uh, subcontinent of India being this big. Yeah. And we see the three cities that marked out Kolam, Gochi, and Kalikas. So the contemporary map, this is a, a, a drawn by Hansen Singh, who's a scholar, a very outstanding scholar, uh, the Silk Road, the American Silk Road. And he drew this map to show uh, the main routes and the secondary routes of the navigation and so on. It's not that the Chinese or Chinese or the maps at the time looked like that. I think those maps were really made for navigation. There were geographical maps. And for example, this one drawn in 1402 in Korea that actually showed incredible understanding of the world geography. Not, I mean, Korea is drawn very large. Uh, but what's amazing is actually the Mediterranean Sea. I don't know whether you can see it. <laughs> it's, it should be colored blue, but somehow it, it wasn't. And then, you, you know, from that, that's the Mediterranean Sea. You can see, you can actually kind of recognize the shape of the Italian peninsula and the Greek peninsula. Uh, so if you think about that, this was a 1402, it was really a gathering of the collective knowledge of navigation and nature. Uh, so this map is pretty uh, amazing. So how does the world look like in the 1400s? This is where the navigation uh, took place and the Amaras took place. And I want to kind of put this graph of 2000 years and divide it into two chunks, or three chunks, uh, that, that you have this kind of uh, more ancient world of infrastructure states of Rome and China dynasty, uh, the uh, the second stage, you know, which I would like to call the first world order, I don't know what this is the right way to describe it. And if we describe our world is the second world order in which the Europeans basically, uh, you know, kind of, you know, follow Emmanuel Wallerstein or Fernand Bardau, he would, you know, understand that the European world economy world system becoming the global, the world system that we live in today. But before the 1600s, the world was very different. So this is really that world that was I'm describing, uh, the first world order. Um, uh, it's incredibly helpful to really use the information uh, that's the research done by Angus Madison, a British economist who actually measured the world's uh, kind of GDP over 2000 years. So the horizontal axis shows 2000 years. And we actually did research to calculate year by year how much uh, uh, each region of the world occupied the percentage of the world GDP. The vertical axis shows the geography, geographical regions. Um, so you can see that for um, most of the uh, world's development in that particular that period that, that I'm describing as the first world order as a uh, uh, kind of world economy being dominated by India and China, uh, they're taking up the like half 
uh, the world's uh, GDP. And what, what's known as, you know, today we talk about the West, uh, it was actually a very recent phenomenon in the kind of Wallacean modern world system. And there's a, there's a kind of enlarged bit to describe that, that earthquake-like radical redistribution of the world's wealth uh, that's related to the kind of modern world system and perhaps uh, connected to the era of uh, colonization. And that era is you know, beginning to that reshape itself to uh, maybe return to something. And Matt, I guess Madison would like to say that, that, that we're on the path to return to that uh, proportion that, that the world had for a long time. Um, and uh, of course, there's a lot of discomfort in that redistribution, but then um, uh, I think uh, the trend is going in that way. So if we look at the world, first world order, and this is really the ocean comes in that, that I know I'm not talking about the Pacific Ocean, but it's, it's Indo-Pacific Ocean. And in a way that, that, you know, if you look at the world, and um, this kind of dotted area in heavy, heavy dotted line, uh, you know, this, this is an area where most of the economic activities of the world um, took place. And uh, a lot of it's really to do with India, Southeast Asia, um, uh, uh, having the kind of climate to have uh, interesting species of things and, you know, the spices and, and product properties that, that were interested, uh, were interesting or desired by the rest of the world. Um, I also thought in uh, the part in Europe in which uh, there's a relationship that can be probably described in this a little bit more detailed diagram to show that, um, that these are the main uh, players uh, in that kind of world economy at the time, um, uh, which um, created that first world order of trade and connections. Uh, so let's go into each region very quickly, Kerala first in South India. And Kerala is uh, quite incredible because of this strip of land is so different from the rest of India because the Western gets uh, trapping with the moisture. So this strip of land known as Kerala in South India uh, is like tropical, you know, not dry. And it's a pretty interesting uh, geography. Um, and what what it has um, offered the world is endless supply of different variety of spices, black pepper, uh, uh, cinnamon and cardamom and uh, ginger. There's been a lot of things that, that uh, became uh, uh, very valuable in, in many different parts of the world and uh, today and we just came back from a trip to to Calicut and you, you look at the the big bazaar street you know this is really uh it's 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 um for me it's kind of a revelation to really understand that those cities you know Calicut didn't you know it's not a very good natural port you know it doesn't really have the port like coastline, it's just a straight coastline, but the way um, the city had its street orientated is really kind of, you know, shooting right into the ocean, and so this big bazaar street is one, and today, of course, they're selling different things, And uh, but one could, I know, take a moment to think that maybe, you know, there was a lot of kind of similar activities and display of their goods, and calculation of daily prices and bags and bags of stuff that was being so was so intense and even today that the spices in the air is like making my eyes tear you know like the tears that got these tears in my eyes it's just uh, incredible experience to see but what's amazing was the the architecture and I can. Uh, uh, I'm showing you one example of a mosque that was built by a rich um, Arab merchant 
that's called uh, Mishko Mask in the 14th century, which is so different from the rest of uh, the, the typology of mosques in, in the other parts of the world. It's, it's timber, it's a steered roof. Uh, it has this kind of ornate um, structure underneath the, the, the roof and so on. Uh, this is the entrance side, you know, unlike the East Asian architecture, which is entered from the side, and you enter from the end. So that's, it's also quite unique. So you, the couple of them around, and it's um, not very documented and very uh, little that's written about them, but uh, amazing. And this is one that that's, um, that I was able to take a few photos of the interior. This is quite amazing. Inverted courtyards that collected water and provided lighting in the large interior uh, of the mosque. And you can see the, the inverted uh, roof line over there. And this is a pond that collected water. You can see the roof dipping down. And it's uh, quite amazing architecture. And this is the third mosque. So, um, What's incredible about Kalika was that it was run by a Hindu king, the Samuji, who then trusted his Muslim uh, ministers who run the commerce for the city. So there was a kind of really mutual agreement. So, you know, I run the city, you do the business, you know, I don't need your uh, sacred animal and then you don't need our sacred animal. So there was, a, there was kind of a deal that was going on. I was thinking that was really interesting. Uh, when Vasco da Gama got to Kalika, and then, you know, he went there with a kind of crusade mentality. I just really started to kind of think that the Muslims uh, was, you know, undermining his, his, uh, his uh, mission. Anyway, so um, on that side, I'm going to go through very quickly because we're familiar with this. It's the Venetian state and the Mamluk uh, Sultanate, uh, who had, of course, jointly had a partnership in Venice and uh, and you know what's now today's Egypt, with uh, crucial cities of Cairo and Alexandria being the choke point of that Indian Ocean trade and going up to the Red Sea. Um, they, it's it's a little little bit uh, strange partnership between you know a Christian state and a Muslim state and the Portuguese hated in Venice for that, uh, uh, but but they kind of made it work in a way. There was you know business partnership and the uh, uh, the Mamluk state controlled the Italian trade, both, you know, from Genoa and from Venice, and they basically put them in control, you know, like allowed them to come in at a specific times, the numbers, they want to control the, the prices, uh, uh, that the, the spices could uh, be sold and, and bought and, and so on. So this is a, a quick image of uh, Cairo. Alexandra. One could imagine that perhaps you know that part is where the uh, the Italian ships would be combined to. Uh, so Venice then became the European business center, as we know. Uh, if you look at you know some of the paintings and the incredible influence of um, of uh, the customs from the Arab world and from the world of uh, Byzantium. And um, uh, this is uh, showing uh, how the use of fog uh, kind of was uh, introduced, uh, apparently by the, the, the princess from the Byzantium Empire who went to Venice and, and, and people were kind of amazed that she ate delicately her food that's previously cut up into small pieces and then she kind of used the fork, picked them up and so on. So Venice, of course, was designed and built with uh, navy in the market and, uh, and to celebrate the, the wealth and power, of course, the political center of uh, Piazza San Marco. You can see that today we see Arsenali, 
uh, the Rialto uh, Bridge area as the central marketplace. And this is uh, the fish market because you know spices at, the, at that time would have been sold here. And the celebration of the status, the wealth, and the kind of sophistication that, that the Venetians uh, were able to develop um, with architecture. So I just kind of resist to show you very quickly that Venice, of course, also had the terra firma. Uh, uh, this is a part of one, and the little chapel called Sorvini Chapel, where this amazing Giotto painting uh, uh, yeah. is, is housed uh, with a lot of blue. And this is really the blue, of course, it was very expensive um, uh, paint. So, um, what the Mamluks did to the Venetians, the Venetians did to the Germans, basically, uh, they have a, a Fondaco, which is put all the German uh, um, merchants uh, there, controlled their business activities and, and charged taxes and from their uh, um, buying and selling. And this is what you can see today if you go there. Also notice uh, maybe some old um, German merchant carved their ax on the go, one of the columns. Uh, the Germans got their money. Uh, you look at the wealth of the Fugger family uh, from um, monopolizing copper and silver production in Central Europe. Uh, uh, the Fugger family, well, Jakob Fugger is known as Fugger the Rich. Uh, once his wealth was 2% of the GDP of the entire euro. He knows how much power he had. Uh, so he used the ancient Roman roads uh, up and down and across, and particularly from Venice to his hometown, Augsburg, um, where he, uh, uh, the, the family kind of developed the wealth from weaving. This is the, the association of weavers in Augsburg. And this is the family palace in Augsburg. It's pretty large and very impressive, imposing. And one of the most interesting project that remains is actually his charity project called the Fugerai. It's one of the first, probably the first surviving social warehousing uh, that exists anywhere in the world. And it still works because you pay almost nothing to stay there. The, 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 the units are really small, but the area is really amazing. It's a very great housing for almost nothing. <laughs> so that, that the original uh, kind of directive of this housing needs to be, you know, kind of Welfare housing, we don't pay a lot of money to stay there, still stays today. So they, uh, the, the Fugu family got their wealth not quite from only weaving and uh, 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 around the city, uh, but from um, developing mines in places like Schwarz in Austria, uh, where uh, if you go to Schwarz and you see of mountainous region, but in these mountains, hundreds of meters inside the mountains were this. And uh, so it's a, quite an experience to go in. <laughs> you really uh, cannot have any claustrophobic, uh, uh, you know, problems with this. It's like tiny holes and really way in darkness and wetness and way into the mountain. And then you, you found this uh, amazing silver mine inside. Uh, dug out by hand by people. Apparently, the average age was, um, uh, uh, it, it was 35 years uh, for those miners. It's just incredible backbreaking hard work to extract silver to be made into coins and then to be exchanged in Venice with all the spices it's brought in India uh, from, from, from Kerala. <clears throat> so, Let's kind of swing to the other side of the world. Uh, and we will be looking at a, a, a string of dynasties in China in that era, the Tang and the Song, the Yuan and Ming state. And those are dynasties that, that thrived at the time. Uh, the age 
around that time, you know, particularly in Song Dynasty and 1960 to uh, uh, 1279, as some kind, you know, you can describe it as an age, a China's age of, uh, of invention. There was a huge amount of uh, technical invention and technologies and material use and so on. Many of them can be traced back to the era. Uh, one of the most ironic reasons for that heightened creativity was that the Sun Dynasty was living a precarious existence, basically with the Mongols expanding, getting very strong, breathing down the necks of the Sun Dynasty. You know, kind of any minute they could just take over. They did take over, but before the Mongols took over, the Sun Dynasty arrived with not the Silk Roads, which was cut off, but with the ocean trade. So that turned the creativity of the Sun Dynasty with, you know, printing, weapon making, you know, clocks and so on, into a sea power, trading power. So it was not, in a way, out of choice, but more like out of necessity that it became that way. And there was a little book uh, that was written, and they made a lot of money out of cheap sea trade. So there was a book called Zhu Fan Zhi, which is a um, uh, a book about various foreign countries, and that described a place called Mulanti, uh, which is Amurangi Tong, which is a kind of Mus Muslim dynasty that arrived in North uh, West Africa, but also Southern Spain. So that was that was the kind of the, the furthest country that this book of the 13th century described, and it doesn't mean that, you know, the, the author of this book was uh, in charge of the tax office, charging, you know, the sea traders and, you know, the, the goods uh, when it was traded in China. It, of course, it doesn't mean that the Chinese traders went to that place, but they still heard uh, those places. Um, so there were 50, uh, I think apparently 58 countries that was described in that book along the way from China to all the way to Spain. Um, so the, uh, when the Mo Mongols took over, of course, they, Mo the, the Mongols established a dynasty called the uh, Yuan Dynasty. And, you know, the nature of that whole dynasty was very expansionist. And so they, mounted naval expeditions to Japan, to Southeast Asia, a number of them were actually successful. Um, but they did notice how thriving, uh, rich, uh, those kind of Chinese coastal cities where Marco Polo said that um, the daily consumption of black pepper in, in Hangzhou was 223 pounds. You know, where he, he was actually, given a official post by uh, the Mongols to go to China. So you probably had some access to official statistics. Uh, so he was, could be so precise. And he said that for every shipload of black pepper going to Alexandra, a hundred went to Chenzhou. So uh, is that an exaggeration? And uh, maybe there's some truth in it. Uh, Ibn Battuta was, uh, a famous Morocco traveler went to Chengdu and he said that this is one of the greatest, you know, port in the, in the port city in the world. He said that I'm wrong. It's the greatest. Um, and uh, there's an Italian uh, traveler, uh, Toscanelli, uh, uh, in Chengdu, saying that Chengdu had more navigators, uh, and merchandise, and then the rest of the world combined. Where's Chengdu? We, you know, like we don't really. <laughs> Uh, I have no clue. Uh, so uh, this is really the reason why this city is, you know, you wonder why they never talked about it. And Chenzhou, maybe it doesn't look much. This is a photo that I took on the street. But that they, there are enough um, surviving evidence to suggest that it was a thriving, like, incredible city. And the city managed to get the UNESCO World Heritage status uh, two years ago, I believe, and very recently. Uh, if you look at this, and sorry, this is really 
the settlement. So this was the old change where all the tax offices and all the selling and you know uh, the play took place. Um, that part that I circled uh, is an interesting, um, incredible bridge. And it was made with huge granite stones, and it's a flat bridge. This has no slope. You know, that to me, is a, an amazing infrastructural piece, a piece of infrastructural work, and that um, that that allows uh, you know the 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 stone, the large pieces of stone. These stones are like eleven meters long, and so one meter thick. It's like weighs you know thirty to fifty tons each. And it's quite a uh, incredible piece of uh, construction. This is the longest bridge uh, in the world at that time. There are quite a few of them uh, at that time. So you can see that that is one evidence. Another one is the Muslim uh, cemetery, uh, the tomb of two followers of Muhammad, uh, going back to 700 um, AD, um, seventh century AD. Uh, you also have mosques there. This one is uh, no longer functioning, but you kind of a, a 1407 imperial um, edit to say that this mosque should be preserved. Uh, you also have uh, a strange temple. You know, it looks Chinese, but it's actually uh, a mannequin. Uh, Temple and, and inside the temple is a statue of Manny. You can recognize that it is Manny uh, because of the, the flowing, the sweet flowing hair that's running down the, uh, the shoulder of Manny. The Manny, Manny is uh, Manny was uh, claiming that he was the successor, the latest uh, reincarnation of, um, of, of uh, Saintly being, uh, the first being Adam, and then it's, it's Jesus, and then Muhammad, and then it's man. So, so, of course, there was a, a, a total non starter with a religion like this in the West, but it survived in China. When he went to, you know, like this religion was in China, and it survived in, uh, in, uh, in Shenzhou. And so, you also have the normative Confucian temples, you know, temples. But, Interesting, you see some of the Indian ornaments in Chinese temples. Uh, incredible, yeah. So the Ming state was basically sitting on all this legacy of uh, innovation, navigation, but they wanted to control it. And the, uh, this is a picture, you know, the Ming was so big on creating state infrastructure. Uh, uh, in order to do that, you need Bureaucrats, in order to produce bureaucrats, they have to run this national civil service examination, and it's really hard to do. And uh, if you succeed in this examination, you're set for life. So this is really the moment when the names were reviewed. And so it's a tense moment, you know, who actually got past the examination, <laughs> and people just get there to look at the sons and, and whether they got the examination or not. Uh, so the Ming Dynasty had, uh, I want to particularly talk about this ambitious uh, uh, emperor called Yunda, uh, who really looked up to older dynasties, earlier dynasties of Han, the Qing, and you know, saying, and he started to uh, develop uh, uh, all kinds of infrastructural projects, like you know, developing a dictionary and building the Great Wall and building the Grand Canal and, and so on. Uh, he also mounted a lot of military expeditions and eventually kind of exhausted himself in all this. So then today, the, the Great Wall in China, most of the wall you see in China is which then built by in that era. And the Grand Canal is, is by far at the time the greatest civil infrastructural project at the time is the dictionary he tried to do. So that's the context. Um, maybe I've gone on for too long for the context, for the goals. So they did achieve quite a lot with these uh, voyages. Uh, state monopoly of trade was certainly one of the biggest goals. 
um, for some more than 250,000 military personnel paid with black pepper. So by monopolizing, banning private trade, monopolizing pepper trade, uh, they were able to kind of get all the, you know, pepper and brought it back to China and used it as a currency, you know, because maybe they ran out of money to pay their soldiers. Uh, so this is just one example. And they made alliances, and this is a list of the alliances that are made in, uh, in Indonesia, in Palembang, in Brunei, in Malacca. Malacca in particular was basically the city that that's founded by Chinese business interests. And then they, uh, uh, one of the most interesting alliances made is in Kochi uh, in India, where they realized um, that, that it was very useful to actually uh, uh, team up with Kochi because Kalika was expands, you know, very expansive, aggressive in terms of controlling territories. And Kochi was uh, a smaller place, and, and uh, there was certainly a conflict. And Kalika was also not treating Chinese traders very, very well for, for some time. So there was that going on. And the, the troops that was on board those ships also uh, kind of brought military capacity that was involved in pacification. You know, that's the kind of the, the concept uh, at the time. So the military interventions included suppressing pirates, uh, putting uh, particularly Sri Lanka. Uh, it was very interesting that, that the Chinese actually um, kind of captured the uh, local leader in Sri Lanka and then installed someone that that was friendly to China, you know, that kind of the captured local uh, king was not friendly, not welcoming uh, the Chinese presence. And so, the, so it was really not all innocent, you know, it was a whole kind of military uh, operation uh, behind it. And there's some, you know, interesting moments of bringing exotic animals to China. There's like a painting of a giraffe that was in the first time uh, that was kind of presented to the Chinese state. And in Singapore, they actually have a huge uh, full-size mock-up of uh, the model of the ship that has giraffe in it, but also uh, uh, rhinoceros. Uh, so this was the kind of animals that were brought uh, to China as well. And uh, if you look at the maps that I showed you earlier, then you see that the Malacca, but then next to Malacca is a place that is marked as a um, uh, government factory. Uh, if we go to that part of the um, uh, world in South India, in the, uh, the, the word China cotton comes up a lot. You know, China cotton is basically the Chinese factory at the time. So I want to quickly present two discussions. Uh, um, I mean, this, of course, is a body of material that's researched a lot, but, but uh, there are the, the, some observations that might be interesting uh, certainly for, for us researching in urbanism and, and thinking about the different world borders is uh, the first one is uh, geopolitics of materials. So this brings, this is connected to this you know, recommended reading uh, that I was asked to provide by Nick, um, that there is an article um, recently published um, called the state function of architecture. The argument here, to put it very simply, is to say that politics in China is material. It's imminent, not transcendental. So anything that carries a power is present in the materials of power. So this is the, 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 the imminence, not transcendence of power. So if you look at the, uh, for example, this, uh, 11, the 12th century construction manual of architects. You know, you look at Chinese architecture history, you always read this. Um, people always take it as an equivalent to Palladio or Vitruvius. I think it's completely wrong. This is actually a book of politics. It is really about how much building material, timber, you are entitled to uh, as a specific ranked official in the state system. So, so that 
you know, it's completely about that. You know, if you read the book, it is about ranking grades. Uh, you know, so so it's pretty interesting. And it's really, and this is the great main code, and that has specifications down to every detail, including the ottomans and the materials and the dress. There's no room that's kind of no detail that's left out of this kind of specificity of the power ranking. Um, so in the Imperial Palace, there are 12 officers that are in charge of the details of the Imperial life. Buildings, uh, edicts, uh, horses, food, seals, and clothes, this is uh, a lot. So I, I'm not listing all of them, but one of them is called Ne Guan Jian, is uh, the, the second one, which is the uh, in English, it will be direct, director of the palace servants, uh, which is in charge of construction. So timber, tiles, you know, like that. So um, the person who was in charge of that office, his name is Zheng He, and Zheng He built this armadas for the name. And he also built uh, the palaces uh, that was, uh, constructed at the same time, and he commanded the armadas uh, to the Indian Ocean. So these are the two simultaneous, most important construction projects at the time. 1406 is Beijing, the new capital. There was nothing much there. It was the old capital was burned to the ground. 1405 is the new, the first armada, which had you know, over 300 ships. And it was both constructed by the Ministry of Works in, in the Imperial Court. So uh, Edward Dreyer um, is a historian of Zheng He. He said that from an essentially land-bound Chinese perspective, construction projects and naval expeditions appear to be related activities. So it's all Zheng He's responsibility. You know, you build buildings, you also build ships. And so the, in a way, the Chinese ships actually look like pontoons floating with buildings on top, you know. I mean, there's a lot of reconstructions of Zheng He's ships, again, because of the destruction of the documents, we don't really have any evidence of how they looked. Uh, and this is one that's in Dubai, and it uh, shows the size. So this is the Columbus um, Carrick, uh, and the behind is the nine sailed uh, Chinese, uh, the largest Chinese boat uh, ship that uh, went to um, Indian Ocean. Uh, again, I think they're flat bottom, you know, they really like floating pontoons, so very effective. Uh, uh, so, shipbuilding technology was really as part of the Song Dynasty kind of innovative era. It was developed quite extensively. You can see shipbuilding, shipyards in Nanjing. Some documents and books uh, that are still remaining describing ship construction. Uh, this is a replica in Nanjing. I don't know how close this is to the original. A lot of it is speculation, um, but it's good. It's very brave of them to do this uh, uh, kind of mock up. But what uh, is more uh, concrete as an evidence is a, a small ship that was discovered in the mud uh, in Quanzhou uh, that showed compartmentalization. So this is really one of the interesting innovations of Chinese shipbuilding that they are watertight compartments. So one part of the ship is broken, uh, the ship keeps floating and then you just repair that part uh, with, with time. But with the European ships, uh, you couldn't do that uh, until much later. And they also had this balancing, water balancing mechanism. It's pretty interesting to actually have a part of the ship uh, bottom being open and floodable. So when you are in big waves and, you know, that back flooding hold the bow up so that you don't slam the bow down, you know, in big waves. So there's a lot of this kind of shipbuilding technology. I was in Baypour in, uh, in Calicut. Um, I was very excited to discover <laughs> that there's uh, two Indian wurus being constructed for Qatar uh, that was sitting there and 
being repaired. Uh, so they had an open back. You know, I was wondering whether there was any uh, connection over there with uh, incredible knowledge. Apparently, this workers, uh, craftsmen, they, they don't use drawings and they just use all in the head. So, uh, so um, the Chinese ships, you know, coming from that perspective, they're like ship building, you know, they're like kind of you know, ship building, ship building. Uh, uh, in, in many of the treatises, and we see there are many military ships and they're constructed like kind of floating castles. Uh, and particularly this one, it's pretty interesting to, to look at, um, but also dragon boats, you know, uh, constructed as, as buildings. And the Ming Emperor would travel in a ship like this, in a boat like this, which is basically like a, a building. And not only this ship building, but also building ship, uh, which is uh, in Chinese garden, you would see uh, it's called Fang, it's part of the ship, part building uh, that you, this one in Beijing as well. So, with all this uh, imminence in geopolitics for China, would be gifts, bringing gifts, huge amount. And this is one of the amazingly kind of uh, still surviving uh, um, stone tablet describes the Chinese gifts. Uh, you know, I was just thinking that the European kind of geopolitical tool is the treaty. You know, you sign a treaty and the Chinese never sign any treaty. I guess they just hand it out gifts. You know, and then <laughs> that's it. And it's about tributes. And so this one in three languages, Chinese, Tamil, and Persian describes exactly the list of gifts that the China, you know, the main court gave Sri Lanka uh, as, you know, gold and uh, silver and, and embroidered silk and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, one of the well-known uh, problems that Vasco da Gama had was that he had almost no gift when he first arrived in Calicut. You know, he arrived with four ships, and one of them was a supply ship. So he didn't really bring too much. It was like a, a mission of discovery. And he was totally snobbed by the king of Kalika, the Samuji, and completely not impressed. And he was so hurt. It was really, and you know, one of the reasons why he really bombarded Kalika uh, the second time he brought 20 ships to Kalika was to revenge this bad treatment, uh, of course, also killing uh, Muslims. Uh, um, so uh, this is the this is a Portuguese uh, kind of portrayal. I think some of it is cut up. Well, you can see the the, the 19th century painting. So it's uh, it's all a kind of reconstruction uh, of the images. Um, in, in people's heads. So that's a young Vasco da Gama talking to the Samuji and holding the gifts. But then uh, what I would imagine was that, that the gifts totally disappointed and, and that was the beginning of a lot of bad blood uh, uh, at the time. There was a word uh, in a phrase in Ma Huan's um, record called Shenhua as in I don't even know how to translate this. It's like maybe making people into Confucians, you know, like Confucianization or civilization. Uh, so, so it is clear that the, the size of the Ming Armada was totally not functionally necessary, um, but somehow to be politically uh, important. It is really about a floating forbidden city arriving at a place, uh, presenting an image of power that then kind of set the scene and basically um, uh, set the narrative in a way to China's advantage. Uh, this is really interesting to know because you think about today's geopolitics that's played out from China, you seem to see the kind of ancient connections with all this uh, maneuvers. Uh, so this brings me to very quickly to the last point, which is the infrastructure state, uh, in a way that 
that China and Greece diverged very early in terms of how to run the state. And of course, the, the archetype of you know, today's uh, modern world system was uh, the Greek independent city. Um, and China never had that. It's basically a state organization always insisting that the interest of the state is above the interest of the people, of the individuals, but individuals benefit from the infrastructure that city, the state provides. So it's like this for a long time, particularly in the formative years of the Chinese civilization, the Han Dynasty, the Qing Dynasty, there were just maniacs of building roads, canals, walls, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of and chariots and horses. And so, as you can see, this is, you know, this is the tomb of uh, the first Chinese emperor uh, who had a very short reign over China, 16 years or so, um, but ideologically defined China to a very great extent. And so this is the, the terracotta soldiers, uh, the horses, and so this kind of shows is uh, amazing. It's, if we go into details, you can see how the state was organized, it's quite amazing. And Han Dynasty lasted uh, on and off uh, 405 years, and that's certainly uh, uh, culturally, you know, uh, cemented the, the mode of operation of an in infrastructure state. And till today, we call Chinese hands. You know, that's where it came from. Roads, a lot. Uh, canals, and one of the first, uh, you know, it's just uh, a lot of the canals. You can, uh, this, this one is particularly, it's called Zhengguo Canal. It's particularly famous in history. I think the most uh, kind of outstanding is this, um, uh, Irrigation project. This thing it has a UNESCO World Heritage uh, status. It's called Du Jiang Yan. Uh, it was built in 256 uh, BCE. It was uh, the great chain engineering project when actually they went from their homeland, which is kind of northwest China, into Sichuan province, which is to the south. So that's the first time Sichuan was actually incorporated into the Chinese territory. And to help them, you know, this became uh, an incredible project. This is basically a project of diverting floods. And so that the water is used as a effective irrigation instrument. So uh, the, the, the thoughts here are, to me, intriguing because from the Greek polis, uh, to the thoughts of Max Weber. And you really see that, you know, Weber even said that the, the problem with the Chinese city is that they never had municipal independence. And therefore, it's really not worth talking about the Chinese cities. Uh, so, so that kind of instinct, I know he was very vocal, but then there's a lot of kind of silent agreement on that in the world of history writing about cities around the world. So is it, you know, does it have to be the case? You know, can we actually think differently? Can we find a narrative to actually work on the infrastructure state in addition? And, you know, uh, this is not to say that we should abandon the independent city, but then uh, we're not talking about a lot of the other parts of the world and we don't have a narrative they don't have a place in world history in that sense. It's only the independence that matters. So, um, so this is really why I want to raise this question and you know, working on it is really not uh, sufficient to talk about this now, but certainly I can raise this as a question. So then you wonder what happened to the Armadas. It came suddenly as a dramatic event, and it disappeared suddenly as a dramatic event. Basically, it just finished. Was the conservative faction thought that it was really economically it didn't make sense. They used too much timber. Timber they needed to build palaces, and uh, the benefits was really not um, declined because uh, if you read 
the main state control of the petrol price, it was basically at a certain point when the supply increased those armadas 10 times higher than the market rate. How could you maintain that? You know, so it really just, the whole thing just collapsed at one point. Um, I think the Chinese conception of the gifts and tributary states idea, uh, to me, it didn't really work very well in the Indian Ocean. You know, if you want to work on that direction, you really need to have really good understanding of the politics. And I'm not sure whether the Chinese had a good understanding of what was going on religiously and politically in that part of the world. So it worked to some extent, but didn't really, uh, didn't probably work in a dramatic way. I think the Europeans had a different idea that's just bombed them into submission and that's the end of the story. You know? So that was really a different approach that worked much better um, in terms of occupying these uh, territories. And there was one more event, which is the Spanish discovery of silver in Bolivia, which upset everything. So, so, so the main then in the end had to rely on the Chinese Spanish trading in Manila to get the silver to China and then just be happy with that. So that really is probably um, uh, multiple reasons why these armadas uh, never continued and uh, China never had the, the Navy for a long time um, until probably the 20th century, again, when they were forced to have one. Thank you. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry it went on so long. There's just so much to talk about. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So many of these um, trade commodities were yeah. plant based. Yeah. So I'm curious in these, are, I don't know what kind of commodities, but the big, the big flotillas of ships, were yeah. there botanists? Were there Yes. Folks who are, who are expert in plant life, and yeah. was there also an extraction and an attempt to replant these species? At that, I'm not elsewhere? quite sure. Did where they they kind of take? I, was I think knowing the Chinese, I think you know because of the scarcity of the records, and I'm sure there were actually many uh, experts on the on the ship. Yeah, mm -hmm. there are twenty eight thousand of them. It's huge amount of people. Yeah, uh, but the Chinese were able to bring. Uh, iron products in the Sun dynasty was really good and very advanced in making iron. So if you go to Chenzhou, you can see the remains of the uh, iron smeltery uh, workshops over there. Uh, they also produced uh, pretty good um, porcelain, ceramics, you know, those are not kind of plant-based. Uh, silk, yes, it's plant based. They also traded tea. So, so these were the Chinese goods were a little bit more manufactured, um, but the Indian goods were very much plant based. Yeah. But this is really, I mean, like, I think it's, it's what the Arab world wanted, it's what the Europeans wanted, you know, and I think the Germans coming down from the north and joining the crusade and they went to Venice and they discovered that the food was too bland. And <laughs> yeah, that was the crusade was what probably triggered all this desire for spices. But then they couldn't figure out how to deal with the Muslims. Yeah, so. so yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about some Fairly recent contemporary events. Yeah. Uh, President uh, Xi Jinping in 2014 come out and spoke against uh, some of the Western archetypes of architecture that are starting to appear yeah. in Chinese cities. Yeah. And I wonder if, if you know, this is pure, purely speculation on my part, I just would like to get your thoughts on it. If in fact, maybe there appeared to be some conflict or competition amongst the emergence of these new archetypes relative to the presence of the, or the, the image of the infrastructure state, whereas cities and the buildings that were occupying them are now starting to become representative of some way 
competing against another idea that the government may have held about itself. In some yeah. Ways. yeah. Well, that's a really interesting reading. Yes, is I, I I would agree with you that maybe those. I mean, some of them are really weird and ugly, and that's probably, <laughs> you know, it's good to think about that. Um, but I think probably this part of it is an instinct of seeing that maybe they become too uh, characteristic and too individualistic, and, you know, it probably doesn't quite fit the state um, uh, kind of infrastructure and, you know, the state image. Uh, I mean, you know that the Chinese cities are very strictly graded, even today. Um, Beijing has a different grade than some, you know, Timbuktu in China. Uh, so you then have different access to resources, different, uh, you know, attractions of investments and companies and so on. So, so is it, it's all graded. Yeah. yeah. So there's a statewide grade, grading of cities. Which is really dimly understood uh, outside China. Thank you. So I'm very taken with your your chart of the three world orders of the of the infrastructural world order, the the, the redoing of Wallace thing, right? Of yeah, Wallace yeah. uh, concepts of world, but it's the infrastructural order, the the first world order, which yeah. is not the first world as we think of it. Yeah. And then the second world order. And I wonder if you had to bracket the shifts with dates, how would you bracket it? Would, would, you know, thinking about, say, organizing, and here this is quite self interested yeah. from the Spencer point of view, a new history sequence in architecture yeah. that's three courses long. Yeah. Right? How, because now we, we do other, we, we use other dates to bracket it, we use different. Yeah. A fundamentally Western perspective and yeah. organizing the way in which yeah. street courses are taught, although they're yeah. taught from a world architecture perspective. Yeah. If you were to flip the whole bit and make mm -hmm. it and flip the chronology so that it was centered in a more in a world market, you know, in the world, yeah. where would you begin and end? And where well, would you begin? Yeah, and my tentative beginning and ending is uh, 600, 600 yeah. to the 1600s. Um, I mean, the symbolic date, of course, is 1598 when Vasco da Gama arrived in Calicut. Um, um, but at, at the other end, maybe the symbolic event was also the birth of Islam. Um, that's a, you know, the Arab, Arab traders actually made it happen abroad into Europe. Um, uh, and that shaped India, shaped uh, Malaysia, Indonesia today in dramatic ways. And, you know, Malaysia and Indonesia, of course, are Muslim majority countries. Uh, you know, we don't often talk about it. Uh, in Christian um, um, Blanche, I hope I'm getting his name right. I wrote a book called Monsoon Islam, which we really, really talk about. Uh, that kind of Islam, not the desert Islam, but the monsoon Islam. It's um, to me this, yeah. That, I think that might be a way. Well, one way to kind of not to talk about this is to always speak of this as the medieval era or medieval period or the dark age. Uh, the lights were very bright in the rest of the world when it was in in Europe. So, so that really is, you know, it's a very simple thing to uh, think about. You just need to kind of turn away to look at the Indian Ocean to see how, how astonished uh, those European travelers were when they went to those places. Uh, the decline of the Roman Empire was a major event in Europe, but it wasn't a major event for the rest of the world. So we actually then begin to write history as if the whole world was in a dark age. Uh, so it's, it's a matter of how to narrate this and bringing this back to uh, some kind of norm um, and maybe stop using some of the terminologies. Okay. Very helpful, thank you very much. Well, yeah, thank you <laughs> for listening. I, yeah. Uh, I, yeah. Pretty interesting. Certainly, a lot of work needs to be done uh, in this area.
thank you for your lecture. I have a lot of uh, feelings towards these topics, and I'm just to say from myself, trained as an architect after I graduated in, 19, in the 90s, let's just say from architecture school. And there was a lot of discussion of post colonial discourse during that time from Edward Said. And this is one of the books I remember before European hegemony, because, yeah. and it really stuck accordingly because I was looking for something that wasn't just about post colonial discourse, it was about pre European colonial discourse. Yes. And that there is a discourse yeah. out there was very important for me to kind of. Um, understand and I think that's what took me into a little bit of study of history yeah. uh, from my architecture background. So I yeah. think this is a really interesting period and this is a whole, I mean, I'm sure there's other ways to enter into this, this kind of narrative, but I think yeah. 1400s, 1500s and this period and the Indian Ocean and the yeah. world history really yeah. is what it is, right? An alternative world history being documented, written, and experienced and lived. I think yeah. it's a really important uh, way, I think, to enter into that study. And I also want to say something about, or it's not quite a question, but that drawing that you showed of the periods, yeah. you know, with the little graph, and then there's this huge dip in it. Yeah, that's uh, English Madison. Yeah, it was a previous drawing that's drawn by somebody else and a research institute that are just using that drawing. Yeah, yeah was, really useful. I was thinking about that and thinking, you know, that's what, that was about world power or the power of empires. And you had Africa, India, uh, and Europe is a very thin line up at the top. And I, I was just thinking about maybe having a counter drawing to that the way you talk about labor, like how much labor there was in these places and where we're headed in the future. So not just talking in terms of uh, power, but also in terms of resources, labor and extraction of mm -hmm. that. And then, you know, how those stripes shape up would be really an interesting counterpoint with this notion of yeah. world domination, for example. Uh, it's, well, that, I mean, that graph has a very simple purpose, which is really to measure the economic output of different parts of the world. It has really, it doesn't pretend to be any political or philosophical analysis. What you observe simply, and not, you know, in relation to labor and power, but simply how the wealth of the world was redistributed over a period of 200 and 300 years and how that kind of matches perfectly with the era of colonization. You can say that people in Europe worked really hard, um, but you cannot only push that narrative uh, to some extent. And there certainly is an element of uh, industrialization, mechanization of production involved in that wealth production. Um, but uh, it's clearly, uh, if you just read, you know, a lot of the scholarship that, that comes out in uh, the study of the economics around the world, and the world, you know, basically, extraction of free labor and that's a huge addition to to wealth and you know like the portuguese imported 250 slaves from africa for the first time and they were sold for a lot of money to do work with no pay yeah so so that those are the kind of economic uh, you want to say plunder yes the portuguese in india wanted to have a favorable trading terms and basically paying very little for, you know, a, not a fair price, but um, unfair price. Yeah. So this is what Wallerstein's kind of point to say that, you know, if the market is perfectly fair, then there wouldn't be capitalism, you know? So, so the whole thing, the whole fundamental element about capitalism is that it is created to be not fair. There's no such thing as a fair market. 
It's about spotting opportunities to create what Karl Marx called the primitive accumulation, and then you build on that. Yeah. Well, thank you for your agreements <laughs> for your camaraderie. It's it's interesting, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think that uh, you know a lot of people talk about like first world and then like third world or even underdeveloped countries and yes. the, the way that that's that that language has been created is through like the lens of capitalism. Oh, you're underdeveloped. You're third world because you haven't exploited yeah. capitalism. Yeah. You haven't you haven't created a capitalist society. Yeah. So like, what sort of new language can we use? And like, what's a new way we can think about it? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, well, the, the the three worlds and it's kind of more or less matches Wallerstein center periphery and semi periphery. Um, it is really, yeah, it's the economic characterization of the world. Um, what we need, the language that we need to develop is, uh, I think you, you know, the answer is actually in your question is really kind of, kind of moving away from describing everything in economic terms. I mean, we have that tendency to do it, you know, anything good is anything that made money. So that really, is uh, is so you know you want to say it's neoliberalism or it's you know it's kind of ideologically imprinted in in the minds of institutions and corporations and not just business institutions but also an higher education institution which would measure your excellence through research funding um, so but how do you, how do we do this? I, I don't, you know, it's it's really, it's a big job. Maybe your generation can do that. Uh, <laughs> I, sorry, this is a bad thing to throw. <laughs> uh, but I can tell you that in the past 40 years, and there's nothing else that's more um, uh, powerful than this financial imagination of uh, everything. Um, resources, ecosystem. You know, even today we talk about uh, uh, kind of addressing our environmental problems. And one of the major metaphors of dealing with that is to imagine that nature is actually a natural asset that has a particular amount of capital that then you can preserve, bank, lend exchange like carpentry yeah. so is, is this like it, it totally doesn't match the complexity of the ecosystem it's so simplistic um, so, so this is really you know i mean one of the reasons why you know i went into this is of course to see spaces you know ways of describing history uh, that probably give us a more reasonable framework and a listening framework that's more friendly to the earth. Not the not the, the financialization of everything. I think on those profound words, <laughs> we should say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I just feel